I'm here today to introduce, which, a great, which is a great pleasure for me, Henry Hale. Henry Hale uh, is, I think, one of the key figures in the modern authoritarian research right now. He is professor of political science and international affairs at the Washington um, University, Georgetown University, and at the same time director of the program of new approaches to research and, and security in Eurasia. Um, he is actually really someone who did not only study Central Eastern Europe, Eurasia, Russia uh, from, f from far away, but he did with his own food a lot of field, wo field work in, in the region um, and um, um, wrote very important um, and influential books in a comparative perspective with a focus on Russia but also Ukraine and plenty of articles, influential and important articles. I just would like to mention a few books and some of them uh, you might, own, or, or might meet during your study here at the Institute. Uh, his most recent monograph uh, published in 2015 uh, 15, yeah, is on patronal politics Eurasia regime dynamics in comparative perspective. And uh, everyone who is interested in understanding what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, but also in post Soviet um, regions, uh, I heavily advise to, to read this book, even if it's not in your literature, obligational literature. Apart from authoritarianism research and, or included in, better to say, uh, in, the, in his research on authoritarianism and hybrid regimes, actually I think you coined this term, hybrid regimes, he also focused on federalism, federalism and uh, ethnic politics. Um, so his second book uh, published monograph published in 2006, Why Not Parties in Russia, Democracy, Federalism, and the State. Um, and he also quite recently published, uh, uh, edited a book about uh, you, you, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, also in a comparative perspective with the title Beyond the Euromaidan, Comparative Perspectives of Advancing Reform in Ukraine 2016. I warmly welcome you to Berlin, and uh, with great joy, joy I listen to your talk, to your lecture. We will have, as usual, first the lecture and then the discussion. And if every, everything is set, we will have a small reception afterwards. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the, the kind words, uh, for the invitation and the welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I look forward to a very interesting uh, conversation with you all. Um, and um, basically, uh, what I want to talk about today is um, what uh, we might call Russia's place in uh, the great post-Soviet puzzle uh, of regimes. Um, and I think this uh, will touch on uh, kind of how Russia relates to uh, Russian politics today, connects with uh, revolutions past and the, the politics over the last century um, uh, up until the current day where I think the logic of hybrid regimes. Um, I wish I could claim that term, but uh, they're, they're, I don't even know who coined it, but I certainly have made a good, a, a good use of that um, because I think it is a useful concept uh, for understanding um, Russian politics today as well as uh, many other regimes in the post-Soviet space. Um, so this great puzzle that I've outlined here in the slides um, you know, is first of all we see now that we are um, you know, basically 25 years after the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union and the independence of these uh, countries, uh, 15 independent countries that emerged from it, um, a great diversity in regime type. Um, Russia is actually kind of in the middle. Uh, one end you have countries in the Baltics that are already you know, democracies in the European Union, whereas on the other hand you have countries that are much more authoritarian than Russia. 
or much more, you know, close to the dictatorship. So Turkmenistan, where you even, uh, up until not too long ago, had golden statues of the dictator rotating to face the sun. Um, and so now you have a, a slightly different shape of the dictator there. Um, and so you have a wide variety of regimes, but you also have a great degree of dynamism of these regimes. And so it's not like the Soviet Union collapsed and then suddenly um, you had countries, political systems, looking like they look today. Um, in fact, uh, you know, some, uh, Turkmenistan looks pretty much the same, um, the Baltic states maybe look pretty much the same, but all the other countries in between have changed quite dramatically um, over the years, and not always in one direction. In fact, I think kind of moving in one direction is in some ways an exception rather than uh, the norm. Um, so what I've tried to do in my various uh, aspects of work um, is, uh, you know, of course I cannot escape the intellectual concepts that I was brought up with and uh, learned about, but to try and um, think about how the system works as best I can by looking on the ground in uh, Russia and other former Soviet countries where I've, I've tried to spend as much time as I can um, developing concepts that um, somehow grow naturally out of the uh, milieu itself. Um, and so it sort of winds up being a, a dialogue between the theories that uh, I found useful for understanding human political behavior um, and uh, you know, the, the, the patterns that I've seen around me that aren't necessarily theorized. Um, and so you know, I call this general pattern patronal politics. Um, and I think this can be quite useful for um, thinking about how we can understand the dynamism and patterns that we see in the former Soviet space, including Russia, um, especially in the post-Soviet period, but I also think it's useful for thinking over the longer uh, durée, um, and uh, you know, how we can explain Russia in particular. Um, so just to preview the main points of the argument, um, and so no surprise to those of you who have read my book, uh, I think the context of fraternalism, and I'll say what that means in a, in a minute or two, um, is key to understanding uh, the politics of this region. Um, and in this particular context, I think one of the implications is that um, politics are inherently um, at, at a minimum, changing constantly. So they're kind of, it has a protein variety, uh, nature to them. Um, but I think it's also uh, cycles of movements and changes in regime uh, tend to uh, be apparent. Uh, these cycles can be irregular or regular, they can be long or short, but they do provide uh, some structure to um, patterns that we see over time. Um, and uh, I think, um, more recently in the post-Soviet space, we've seen actually a trend towards more regularity in the cycles of change that we've seen, make, meaning they're a little more predictable than they were initially. Uh, but again, it's an open question where things will go uh, after, you know, in, in the future, obviously. Um, so what do I mean by paternalism? Um, basically, uh, paternalism is a, uh, what I call a social equilibrium, so self-reinforcing social outcome, in which uh, the collective pursuit of political or economic needs uh, and ends um, tends to be organized mainly through personalized rewards and punishments meted out to specific individuals through networks of actual personal acquaintance. And so basically this is a society where connections matter. When people organize to do things, it's usually through some kind of extended uh, network of your own connections, or you know, you, you know somebody who knows somebody, and this is how things get mobilized to get something done. Um, and so this is distinct from uh, patterns of politics that um, are often theorized in developed countries of the West, uh, including the United States, which is the one I know best, um, and uh, the politics of what Benedict Anderson has called um, imagined communities. Um, and so what Anderson means by imagined communities is not that they're made up or false. Uh, but what he means is that politics often organizes uh, among people who imagine themselves as a community, who think of themselves as a community, but have not actually met in person, and are not necessarily linked through a chain of actual personal acquaintance. And so, um, for those of you who've studied the United States, um, you know, politics often mobilizes around um, broad issues that people identify with. So, um, you might mobilize through the National Organization of Women, or the uh, National Rifle Association. Um, and you might donate money to them, you might send a check to them, um, even though you don't know anybody there, right? But you kind of trust somehow that uh, this mobilization will be effective. Whereas in most of the former Soviet space, um, including Russia, 
Um, that kind of behavior, um, it's not that it never happens, but it's fairly rare. You, you, people don't, as a rule, um, donate money to some abstract organization or cause unless they know somebody um, working through it. Um, you know, know somebody who can kind of lend credibility to the effort. Um, so again, not to say that it never happens, but it, it fairly rarely happens. Um, and so the way people get things done is by working through um, people that you know. And that's one reason why parties in Russia, for example, are often criticized as being kind of these uh, top-down, leader-oriented parties. And that's because oftentimes parties are, in fact, uh, composed largely of the extended personal networks of the leaders. Um, so people they know, people they work with, and people who know them. Um, and you get some people who join in according to the ideas um, and maybe make connections that way, but that tends to be um, not how the parties, the, not the core of those parties, at, at least most of them, again, with you know, some exceptions, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, and one of the important points here, which I point out here at the bottom of the slide, is that um, this kind of organization of society, um, I think it's useful to think about as the world historical norm uh, not something that's kind of deviant or unusual. And if you just think back about how human history, um, you know, if it would have arisen, um, the smallest human communities were small enough for everybody to know each other. So of course it's natural that one would be um, operating through personal connections. Um, and, and so when you extend a polity's control to um, other communities or regions, oftentimes it went through identifying local networks or establishing people in place who would make these connections forcibly or, uh, or, or, or by co-opting them, um, and governing through these extended political networks. So if you, uh, you know, read the history of how the Russian Empire expanded, for example, into you know, different territories, that was often how it would work. Um, it would find locals that it could work with and somehow co-opt um, and uh, would kind of work them into the, you know, the, the czarist system, um, except in those cases where the local community would basically be um, uh, kind of obliterated or destroyed. So those are kind of the two options. Um, but uh, um, in, in this sense, kind of the developed West, uh, in kind of having this large degree of personal, of impersonal politics, um, is an exception and something that appeared only fairly recently uh, in world historical time. Um, so we often think about kind of the, the uh, you know, kind of the effects of patronalism or uh, what it is. I mean, we can think about like a number of different things that tend to go along with it. And these are pretty readily identifiable and they're all kinds of measures. And so I don't think that patronalism boils down to any of these things. Um, but uh, there's close associations that help us identify which countries are more patronal than others. Uh, patronalistic countries tend to be uh, high in corruption, have weak rule of law, um, low social capital, the impersonal sort that Robert Putnam, for example, theorizes about. Um, patrimonialism, neo-patrimonialism, kind of good Weberian terms, um, are describing something very similar with respect to authority structures. Um, clientelism, patron-client relations, these are all concepts that are highly associated with patronalism. Um, and so I'm, not, I'm definitely not trying to supplant these terms. I just think patronalism is a description of the broader social context um, that gives rise to a lot of these other uh, phenomena. Um, and one important aspect of it is that um, I call it equilibrium um, because it, it functions as a vicious cycle. It's self-reinforcing in a certain way. Um, so if you talk to people in Russia, Ukraine, um, they don't like, for example, that positions of power tend to go to um, relatives or close associates of the people that are elected, right? They don't like nepotism. Um, your competitions for jobs often work by who you know. Um, they don't like this in principle. They don't like corruption. Um, but at the same time, in their everyday life, people take advantage of these things when they have that opportunity. So you might be very deeply opposed to having to pay a bribe to um, get an appointment with a doctor. But when your son or daughter is in need of, of some kind of urgent surgery, and that's what the doctor's demanding, you're going to do it. Um, or even if the doctor isn't demanding it, um, people may actually propose it anyway um, to try and jump the queue if they're feeling desperate. So um, people take advantage of it at the same time that they don't like it. Um, but I think the key is, the why this is the case, is that um, it makes sense to take advantage of it uh, from a certain point of view, and arguably even a, a certain moral point of view, um, if you really think that this is the norm, this is how things work. And I think that's often just how people accept it. This is just how things work. And so you're forced to make certain very difficult choices within that uh, type of system. 
Um, so one example uh, you know, that I give in the book, um, but you can take from lots of, in lots of different forms, um, is uh, you know, say you are a member of parliament uh, from a, a highly paternalistic country, and say you are representing a particular geographic district. Um, if you want to serve the interests of those people, you're going to do what you can to um, bring in jobs, bring in economic investment, and bring in development. And in this particular type of context, if you refuse to pay anyone off to get the resources you need for that, to bring in the investment, um, to do what it takes to um, bring in those resources for your own constituents, um, you're very likely to be seen as uh, incompetent. So, uh, you know, people might see you as kind of standing on your high horse and, uh, you know, carrying on about your own moral um, authority. Um, but if you don't actually do things for people that actually make lives concretely better, um, you may be regarded in a negative light, not a positive light. Um, and this goes on for all kinds of, of personal examples uh, as well. So um, there's a strong tendency in the system for people to want to, um, you know, it's not that they like doing it, but they think it's necessary in order to get something real done. So not all this corruption, as we call it, is venal in the sense of being about personal gain. A lot of it is just people doing what they think they need to do in order to get something done. Um, and, uh, but, but critically, uh, the key is they expect that this is the norm. Um, so this legislator, you know, say he just stood on his high horse and didn't do it, um, uh, you know, basically somebody else is going to move in and take these resources. So kind of this all depends on people thinking that, um, you know, if I don't do it, um, nothing's going to get done. Um, other people are doing it, therefore this is just the way things have to go. So. Um, the reason it's hard to change then is because there's just a very deeply embedded expectation based on the normal as people experience it growing up and in their professional lives as to just how things get done. So you have to, to change it, you really have to change not only people's practices or their willingness to participate in this activity, but their expectations. You have to convince them not only that you can make a change in your own life, but that everybody else is going to make a change and that this change is going to last. Um, and that becomes something that's extremely uh, hard to do. And I think um, uh, the Russian Revolution uh, is one example that maybe helps illustrate this, and I'll come to it in, in a moment. Um, so um, if we want to look at kind of which countries are paternalistic in the world, um, I showed you a map earlier um, in my book and elsewhere. I've relied on a typology of countries that was developed by Herbert Kitschelt uh, and several colleagues of um, post-communist regimes. And so basically, they did a categorization based on which regimes have the strongest uh, patrimonial element, um, which, as I mentioned before, is a concept that I, is highly related to patronalism, sort of you know, regarding the merger of uh, kind of private and public interests. Um, and what we see is that pretty much all the former Soviet countries, except the Baltics, fall into the category of the most patronalistic uh, or patrimonial countries. Uh, the Baltic countries fall into the uh, moderately patronalistic ones, and then um, you know, a lot of the East Central Europe are among the, the less paternalistic uh, countries, um, although there's some interesting dynamics here as well uh, in places like uh, Hungary. Um, but um, I think this, this, this abstract social logic um, has some very important implications for um, how politics takes place and how politics works. Um, and so um, I'll outline a few of them here that I think are relevant. And the first one is that um, the most important collective political actors in this type of society, I think it's useful to think about them um, mostly as extended networks of actual political <laughs> acquaintance. So these are broad, extended power networks of people that are linked through these personal connections, um, not so much by ideas. Um, and I think that these networks um, are more important actors in uh, kind of the moving and shaking of politics um, than are formally defined institutions like political parties, which we would normally look to in the West as normal actors, as major actors. Parliament, even the state, I think, it, it tends to be composed of in part and, or comprised by these different networks, uh, firms, or you know, even social movements. Um, and the important point, I think, one of the important points is that a, a very powerful network um, interpenetrates all of these different forms of organization, or at least a large majority of them. So, if you're a powerful network, you might have your people in not only a party, but if you're a really strong network, you have your people in multiple parties, including parties that are diametrically opposed, because you want to hedge your bets. Um, 
So in the Russian case, this has involved, uh, you know, like oligarchs contributing to the Communist Party as well as to the Market Reform Party. Um, you tend to have, you want to have your people in Parliament. You have your representatives in the presidency and the state offices. Um, you might have your business interests. Uh, you probably own some kind of media if you're a really powerful uh, 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 network. Um, and uh, you know, you might even have social movements that you can mobilize at different points in time to back you up, or or civil society organizations. So. These, uh, these networks are kind of penetrating all of these um, formal institutions, but they can act in concert when necessary um, for mobilizing political force. Um, and they're roughly hierarchical. So let me um, uh, actually give you a few examples. So um, in terms of Russian politics, for those of you who um, have studied it, you talk, or even just reading the news about it, right? Um, one powerful set of oligarchs, uh, of networks we call oligarchs, right? And so sometimes we just think of these as particularly powerful business people. Um, but in fact, it's a whole set of, of connections that they have, um, that, uh, that they mobilize. So you know, again, they, they buy their people in parliament, they buy their people in the state, they have their own media, uh, not just business. Um, regional political machines are kind of this, the same kind of thing based out of state structures at the local level. Um, in places, especially Central Asia, uh, we can talk about clan networks, um, although usually they're not actually based on kinship. They might have a kinship core, but they incorporate anyone else who could be useful to them politically, who they have some connection with. Um, State-based networks, um, such as Vladimir Putin's, those people that he's been able to build relationships up through his position in the state. Um, and if we go back earlier in Russian history, before the uh, Soviet period, um, You'd have the Boyar family network. So, you know, some of the uh, historical research on Russia, like John Ladon and others, um, you know, they write about um, the, the czarist families uh, competing against each other, basically competing for influence, and that this was a large part of the um, political experience in czarist Russia. Um, and in the Soviet period as well, you had uh, these different kind of chains of command of different, um, you know, members of the Politburo who would have their people in the party structure kind of moving up or down with them. Um, so just a little more uh, concrete, I don't know how well people can see the, um, the, the, uh, the typescript here, but this is just a concrete example of one particularly powerful network um, in, uh, in Russia in 1999-ish, uh, um, when the mayor of Moscow, um, Yuri Lushkov, was competing for the presidency. So in competing for the presidency, it wasn't just Lushkov with some campaign uh, support staff um, and national reputation and a platform competing for people's hearts and minds. Uh, in fact, as Moscow mayor, um, he had a huge concrete network that um, can be traced through these actual personal acquaintances from different phases of his life or different aspects of his life that would mobilize for him when competing for the presidency. Um, and so, you know, if you just kind of look here, he's the Moscow mayor, he's there at the top. Um, so, uh, of course, he has his Moscow city administration. Um, but that means that he has control over various uh, agencies of the city, um, fire department, police, um, and these agencies can be used to um, send inspections to um, opposition members uh, that, uh, you know, people that you might want to kind of put pressure on, um, you know, permits, licensing, um, schools and hospitals under the authority of the city um, that could be pressured to deliver the vote when needed because they're dependent on, on city resources. Um, employees and relatives and friends of people employed by cities, uh, city structures. Um, you can go to ties that were uh, through his political party, the Fatherland All Russia Bloc. Um, this included a lot of people who uh, were tied together through all the Communist Youth League uh, networks and other connections from him at different points of his life. Um, he also had a lot of economic relationships. So um, a friend and uh, actually a brother-in-law, uh, Yevtushenkov, um, uh, was the head of this big firm, Sistema, um, that uh, had a lot of the business in Moscow. And so it worked in close cooperation with the Moscow mayor's office. Um, and so held a lot of the property and therefore was able to work through, or to work as, as part of this larger <laughs> political machine. Um, and the city of Moscow itself also was able to form economic relationships with lots of other regions in Russia, um, just because Moscow held a lot of authority. Um, and then you can tie in uh, Lushkov's wife, Elena uh, Vaturina, um, who is uh, at the time um, Russia's richest woman, I believe, and uh, the head of a, a billion dollar firm. Um, and uh, all of its business partners, employees, and clients, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
So you can see that this kind of network can be very, very powerful. Oh, and I didn't even mention its, its media outlet, TV Center, which was one of the four big channels in Russia um, that people, most people in Russia could watch. Um, so this was a formidable network held together largely through these interpersonal um, connections uh, that was able to mobilize um, as a unit, even though they come from all kinds of different formal organizations um, in support of Luzhkov's presidential bid in 1999-2000. Uh, of course, he lost, um, but it was still just as an illustration of the uh, kind of network that I have in mind. Um, so a second and third implication are um, that these networks, like Luzhkov's and all kinds of other different ones, oligarchs, uh, what have you, um, need direct and personal access to power in order to survive and thrive. Um, because in a society where it's not just that connections are significant, but connections are highly determinative of your life chances, um, these networks cannot rely on courts or the rule of law to protect them if uh, you know, they <coughs> fall out of favor with the people in power. Um, so what you need is you need to establish some kind of good relationship with the people in power, either a neutral relationship, but better yet, you have better protection if you actually have some kind of deal struck with the authorities. Um, and so uh, basically, this desire for a personal connection to power becomes imperative. Um, another imperative is to be on the winning side of struggles for power when uh, they occur. Um, I, again, I should probably correct this a little bit to say at least you don't want to be on the losing side of a struggle for power. Um, so you, you might not need to win, but at least you need to be on the side of the winners. Because if you lose, <laughs> um, then you suddenly become on the chopping block. And so you, you become subject to, uh, or you become very vulnerable to having your assets seized by the winning, uh, the winning side. Because um, again, you can't rely on courts or rule of law or other things to uh, protect you effectively. Um, so it becomes pretty much as important to, or even more important, to figure out who will win and make a combination with that person, then it becomes to um, uh, find out who agrees with you. And so again, this is why, for example, um, some of Russia's biggest oligarchs, including uh, uh, Mikhail uh, Khodorkovsky, um, people from his organization were um, contributing to the Communist Party effort for the presidency in the 1990s, along with that of the pro-market forces. Um, partly because he wanted to kind of hedge his bets, or, uh, or the people in his organization wanted to hedge their bets, um, in case the communists actually won. So um, two more implications uh, are um, because each network, um, if you have a bunch of different networks of this type in society, each one has its own resources. Um, kind of what it means is that which side actually wins depends on which side individual networks support. So if you're the head of a network and you're not powerful enough just to win on your own, um, you might have the power to tip the balance between one network or other. And so what this means is then, is that um, it might not just be a question of saying, okay, I think that patron is the most powerful, so I'm gonna make uh, accommodation with that person. Um, you might have the power to make that person the patron, or you might have the power to make that person the patron. Or those people might be able to get together without you, uh, or they may be able to get together and make you the patron. And so what this means is that kind of the, the, the power dynamics here are in part of a kind of game of coordination. Um, and so it's a politics of coordination. Networks trying to coordinate their activities um, in ways that uh, kind of determine a lot of the dynamics in paternalistic politics. Um, so just as I uh, kind of mentioned here, I think you know, which side you back in a struggle partly depends on which side you think other networks will back. Because if you think other networks are all going to get together and do something anyway, uh, and that's going to be enough to win, you want to be part of that. Um, but which side other networks will back depend on which side you back. Um, so again, this, this coordination becomes really, really uh, important. Um, and so the last couple implications that I'll mention before uh, getting into some of the substance is, um, uh, first of all, that factors that can um, disrupt coordination among these elite networks, these, these kind of uh, paternalistic networks, um, tend to promote political openness. Uh, because if the elites can't really well coordinate on any single authority, can't agree on who's likely to be the most powerful in the future, um, or can't find some kind of accommodation of interest between them, um, there's going to be an ongoing competition among these networks. 
and uh, it's going to be hard for any one to squelch the others. And so you're likely to have this kind of ongoing political uh, ferment. Um, and so factors that can disrupt political uh, coordination in these societies are, uh, of course, succession crises when uh, it's not quite clear. You know, like at, at any given moment when there's one patron in power, okay, obviously that person is in power. But what happens once that person is gone? That might not be clear. Um, losses in war can also disrupt coordination because it discredits the uh, incumbent power. Um, there might appear new uh, focal points for coordination, so alternatives to the chief patron that might somehow arise externally or internally. Um, factors that promote coordination, however, um, tend to promote political closure. Um, so one way, for example, that, that uh, the Russian system managed to minimize, uh, certainly not eliminate, um, problems of succession was through uh, the dynastic principle associated with the monarchy. Because uh, at least you would limit the, the set of possible power contenders, or realistic power contenders, to a certain set. So they'd fight among themselves, and sometimes you'd fight over who was eligible, but a lot of people were ruled out. And so that simplified the process and made it much easier for the czarist regime to survive over long periods of time these, uh, uh, price, uh, these uh, succession crises that might occur when a czar uh, died. Um, strong ruling parties can also play this role. So in the Soviet Union, I think this had a large uh, uh, um, a role in keeping the Soviet Union stable, although succession was still a, a problem for it because it didn't really have the succession process itself institutionalized. Uh, China may be a better example of a, of a system that has a, a succession process in place that kind of helps it uh, survive for a long period of time. Um, so I said I'd talk just uh, very briefly about kind of how all this plays out in Russian history, kind of as an example. Um, and so basically, you can think about the czarist regime surviving for a long time, I think partly because you know, there's no democracy, uh, or at least not much to speak of, um, uh, and you had this uh, dynastic principle established. So how did it collapse? Um, well, I think one of the things that, that shook it, of course, was World War I. And um, the losses that it was incurring in World War I, which basically led to uh, a loss of faith in the future of the czarist regime. It wasn't clear how this regime was going to survive in the longer run. And so you saw um, soldiers defecting from the front um, and the, basically kind of the collapse of the regime uh, uh, from inside. Um, eventually, the, in the power vacuum that followed, you had the Bolsheviks take power. Um, and in the book, I talk about the Bolsheviks as actually a kind of anti patronalist uh, movement. Because uh, they were opposed to the corruption that they associated with the old regime and associated with uh, you know, czarism in particular and its elite politics and its uh, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, it, it's kind of dynastic uh, principles, it's a very undemocratic nature. And um, I think there was a genuine attempt there to um, try and restructure politics on a more formalized grounds, right? Certain um, you know, criteria were to matter more than individual connections, you know, whether you had a totalitarian proletarian background, like a working, working class background, um, organizational parties. I mean, that was one of Lenin's main things was to have like a very strongly centralized, organized party. Um, but in the end, um, patronalism survived it largely, I think, because uh, of uh, thanks to Stalin. Because um, basically, um, if you go back and kind of look at some of the debates that were had by Bolsheviks, you know, the earlier Bolsheviks, you know, people like you know, even Trotsky um, and Bukharin, I mean, they were debating these different ideas about how socialism should structure and uh, should be structured. And so they were debating kind of one way versus the other. Whereas um, Stalin eventually kind of came in and says, OK, I'm just going to build my political machine. And so he initially um, had this position, which was seen as kind of a minor position in the Bolshevik uh, kind of uh, you know, larger scheme of things uh, as organizational secretary, which uh, my old professor Jerry Huff used to call a uh, essentially human resources department head <laughs> in the Communist Party. Um, and uh, you know, he wasn't considered one of the big players originally. I mean, he was a big guy, but like, uh, you know, not compared to the you know, Trotsky or Bukharin, who were kind of the, the more dynamic figures. Um, but he used his power of appointments to appoint people who he expected to be loyal to him. And so um, each time when there was a battle, he was able to mobilize these people and gradually take down one by one um, different opponents until he won. And then this sort of restored the paternalistic uh, nature of the regime, which I then, then think continued to define uh, the Soviet uh, and, and generally communist uh, practice uh, up until 1991. And so why did it collapse in 1991? 
Well, I think there too. I mean, it it, it solved to some extent, um, you know, the problems of uh, of instability and the cycling by being not democratic and having an institutionalized party that kept things in line. Um, but Gorbachev actively dismantled these very things um, and actually called for there to be more competition. Um, and uh, moreover, he democratized the Soviet Union in a way that um, created a natural alternative to himself as the key authority figure, and that was um, democratizing Russia as a single unit um, within the Soviet Union. So suddenly you had one republic that contained more than half of the Union's population. You had a, uh, a government representing that, uh, that unit, and um, that became eventually uh, President Boris Yeltsin, um, who then just naturally was an alternative possible focal point, and so uh, for other elites trying to figure out where to align their interests. Um, and so basically this kind of dual power situation <coughs> led to uncertainty about who was going to be powerful in the future, combined with Gorbachev's own reforms and own calling for uncertainty, um, ultimately leading the whole system to, to collapse again. Um, so I mentioned uh, elections. Um, elections could both complicate and support the kind of coordination that we uh, you know, would need to see, uh, that I, the kind of uh, coordination among these networks that I think underpins authoritarianism in the post-Soviet world. Um, and so on one hand, um, an official election result becomes the key expression of dominance. Uh, because once you introduce this principle and you allow at least some competition, um, the authorities, in order to stay in power, need to manufacture or somehow produce an actual election result that sanctifies the winner. Um, and so this means then that the networks are kind of forced into the situation of struggling to um, uh, obtain that particular kind of election result. Um, and so what this means is I think that when you have elections and competitive elections in highly paternalistic societies, it's almost always messy and corrupt. Um, paternalistic countries are rarely ever considered um, liberal, fully liberal democracies. Instead, uh, it tends to more resemble um, battles of political machines. And so I think this is why we tend to see a lot of the, the world having uh, like hybrid regimes, as I call them, that combine elements of democracy and autocracy, because uh, they're illiberal. They're not fully liberal. They involve manipulation, um, you know, buying of media coverage, um, illicitly um, under the table transfers of resources, um, all these other things designed to try and help produce the needed election result. Um, but at the same time, even where the incumbents have a, a significant advantage in manipulating all of these different kinds of resources, um, they still do give an edge, they still do get an edge from having actual um, public support. So by focusing on all these kind of elite battles, I'm not saying that public opinion doesn't matter. Um, in fact, when you introduce elections into the situation, uh, and arguably to some extent even if you don't, um, it just becomes easier to win these struggles if you have public support. Um, if you have public support, um, it becomes one of the weapons that you can use against your uh, rivals um, because it's harder to falsify results um, if you uh, actually don't have public support. And it, it's uh, easier just to get people to vote your way. Um, if you have public support, you can bring your supporters out into the street, and if, you don't, if, if it's not just that you're paying them and they actually care about you, they're going to be more likely to, to fight for your cause. Um, so public support matters in trying to uh, manufacture even an uh, election result. Um, and so that's elections. Um, and then the other part of the argument here, which I think all helps us understand where things are going in the former Soviet space, is um, has constitutions in mind. Um, and so the argument is that presidentialist constitutions tend to promote the coordination of these networks. And so I think that by coordination, I'm talking about the kind of coordination that makes a regime look much more open. So if we imagine a, a very simple paternalistic world where the, these uh, kind of lines and dots represent networks, um, say you have two roughly um, equal um, kind of pyramids of power, um, people deciding which one to join aren't going to be clear on which one is going to be more profitable to join, right? Because it's not clear which one of these two would win. They have roughly equal chances. Um, we assume there's no prior constitution. Um, and so uh, basically this is kind of a, 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 a sustainable um, competition. But if we introduce a presidentialist constitution to that situation, 
Um, what this does is basically creates a single post that um, symbolizes power that only one network can possibly occupy at a time. Because only one person can be president. And so what this does is, first of all, it makes it desirable to have this post. So it creates a competition sort of winner take all. Um, and it, once you get it, it signals that you're the more powerful person. That's one reason they want it. Um, and even if initially upon getting the presidency, um, you're not any more powerful than anyone else, um, all other things equal, just the symbolism of having control over that post is likely to make people over time gradually, you know, if you have to choose which one to join, <coughs> and there's no other difference, well, I'll just go with the presidential one. Um, so I think the symbolism sort of has that power. And so over time, it gives these uh, networks incentive to coordinate around the presidency. And so um, eventually we get these people that were formerly neutrals, kind of small networks or individuals um, deciding to join the network of the presidency. Um, and uh, the result is they all kind of conglomerate into this, this type of system that I've called a single pyramid system, um, which tends to have high degrees of political uh, closure and is more authoritarianism. Uh, is more authoritarian. Um, and so uh, basically what we're getting then is the, the, the authoritarianism that we see in, in a lot of the former Soviet countries, uh, including Russia, um, is I think this kind of uh, single pyramid system uh, type of uh, arrangement where there are lots of different networks involved um, and they've gradually coordinated their authority around the president and the president has encouraged this in various different ways. Um, and it pretty much leaves um, smaller ones, smaller networks in society, the choice of either joining or um, being squelched, because they don't have any opportunity of, um, uh, of, of really making a go of it themselves. Um, and so in this kind of situation, it tends to um, greatly resemble authoritarianism, because even if the president of the country doesn't order the opposition to be repressed, um, these different networks that have the resources are not going to want to contribute to opposition politics. Um, they might not want to even give a, 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 you know, a theater hall to an opposition candidate to hold a rally. Um, so even if you're not directly repressed by orders of the president, you can still find it very, very difficult to operate. You're not going to get media time. You're not going to have a lot of things go your way if you're in the opposition. Um, so kind of the point of all this, uh, to some degree, is to say that the 1990s, I think, um, can be understood as uh, a history of single pyramid systems emerging in the former Soviet Union. And so it's a history by which, when Gorbachev basically disrupted the old political equilibrium, um, and in all these former Soviet state, uh, states, you had complete uncertainty as to what the nature of power even was, how was power going to be organized in the new era. Um, but they still had their personal connections. And they still knew the importance of friendship, and it became even more important, arguably, during the times of economic crises, where you had to depend on friend networks in order to get goods and resources. Um, initially, there's this period of disruption, right? It was almost like chaos. Uh, you know, the, the leaders didn't really know how to manage things, and the people on the ground didn't really know. So it was open competition. It was this feeling of freedom. Um, but over time, um, either because leaders learned how to practice their certain politics or the ones who didn't learn got replaced. Um, pretty much all 12 um, uh, high paternalism, so that's basically not the Baltic states, uh, former Soviet states, uh, wound up first of all with presidentialist constitutions. Um, and then um, all but one of them then developed this form of paternal presidentialism. Um, and the only exception I think is Moldova where um, you had a competition for power, but uh, that was the one case where the parliament actually won. And so in all the other cases, you had battles for, for power. Uh, the parliament resisted Boris Yeltsin in 1993, and even before that, uh, Yeltsin's solution ultimately was to uh, bring the tanks in and once and for all quell the parliament and establish Russia as a presidentialist uh, state that was dominated by the president. And ever since then, um, you know, you've seen this tendency towards uh, the consolidation of uh, a single pyramid system. Um, whereas in Moldova, the parliament happened to win, and uh, so the parliament then took the action of eliminating direct elections for the president and um, making the president elected within the parliament. Um, so uh, basically the parliament got power. 
But uh, at the same time, because of the problem of succession and um, the need for coordinated expectations to exist about the future uh, in order to, to underpin the stability of these regimes, um, their apparent stability can vanish uh, once expectations, anticipations starts to arise about the leader departing. And that is, um, the leader essentially becomes a lame duck. Um, and what that means is that basically, if you're a network in the system, and okay, you recognize the leader X, chief patron, is in power now, have to do everything he tells me to do. Um, but then suddenly you realize, okay, in a period of two years, for some reason, that person is likely to leave office. So suddenly you have to start thinking, okay, well, what's, you know, yeah, 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 you know, he may give me an order now, but that really is only good for the next two years. I want to survive long into the future. So you need to start thinking around about who's going to be in power after that leader. And if you really don't trust anyone else out there, maybe you need to start thinking about doing things to make sure you're the leader. Um, or at least to make sure that the worst enemy of yours is not the next leader. So it's just the classic succession problem, um, but kind of magnified um, by the system. So once these expectations of, of leadership departure start to um, emerge, kind of get on the table, the regimes become very fragile. And uh, these networks start jockeying for a position to protect their interests or expand their interests if they think that they're capable of uh, doing so. Um, and uh, so this competition, I think, is certainly more than enough to um, contribute to the breaking up of these networks. Um, and so um, the typical result, I think, um, is not that uh, the collapse of these regimes means you get democracy. Um, it's not democratization, even though a lot of times the, uh, you know, you get a revolution uh, 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 and it looks like democratization, the leader's overthrown, uh, the opponents are saying, we did this in the name of democracy, um, looks like democratization, but uh, typically the result, in fact, is um, uh, something of the reverse. Um, and so, um, and I should say that kind of when these struggles break out, I kind of skipped over that line there, um, is uh, public opinion plays a huge role in influencing who wins these struggles once they uh, break out. So uh, they look like democratization when you get a collapse, partly because um, you see the authority of a leader decline, partly because public opinion influences which uh, network wins the succession struggle, but then once that new network is in place, all the incentives are there for the same thing to happen all over again, um, unless you get a new kind of constitution. So um, this is why I said before that cycles could be regular or irregular depending on sources of expectations on succession. Um, they can be irregular because succession crises often arise for irregular reasons. A leader um, can fall into ill health, um, can make just stupid moves, right, that undercut uh, you know, the, the sense among other networks or even the broad public that the leader is fit for office. Um, you can have exogenous shocks, uh, like a defeat in a war. So if a leader leads a country into an ill-advised war, uh, loses badly, um, you can undermine that leader's authority. Um, so that's why, in, in some points, these kind of periods of openness that are punctuated by lame duck periods uh, occur irregularly. Um, but they can also occur regularly, to some degree. Um, when term limits are on the books, they automatically provide a kind of focal point for people who start thinking about the future. And, um, you know, so if you're a leader and you're limited by the Constitution to two terms, for whatever reason you haven't been able to change that or haven't moved to change that, so as long as that's on the books, people around you are going to start thinking about, well, maybe that time is when the time is when that patron is going to leave office. And so that kind of keeps this issue of succession on the table and becomes more and more acute the closer that moment of succession comes. Sometimes leaders just decide not to run. It happens. We don't think about that happening often, but they have the legal right to. They're in health, good health, and they decide not to run. Um, other times they might not have term limits. They might want to continue running, uh, they might actually continue running, but they just become uh, too old to be seen as credible uh, leaders by a substantial part of the population or um, people within the elite circles. Um, so um, in the early 1990s, we saw these irregular uh, regime cycles dominate. So um, you know, if, you, if you look back at like, the early Soviet history, it was just a history of like, president after president getting overthrown. Some cases more than once. So you have all these flameouts, 
um, Zviad Gan Sahertia in Georgia, um, you know, really tried to institute uh, an authoritarian nationalist regime very quickly, uh, quickly led to revolts by people uh, within the country, led to a civil war, he was eventually killed. Uh, Tajikistan, you saw something similar, sort of some massive blunders that the uh, Nabiya made in, in like arming uh, certain people to defend him, which led to a, a, a civil war uh, again, and, and he was he, he wound up dying as well uh, in the early 1990s. Um, Azerbaijan, you saw a couple failed presidents in a row, um, and, uh, so you saw a lot of these in the early failures when a lot of this was uncertain, when people were uncertain about kind of what power was and how it was to be arranged. Um, but eventually, um, these leaders learned, and um, since. Maybe the, you know, it doesn't exactly date temporally, but uh, basically since the mid 90s. And so what I define it as is once the initial single pyramid system was set up in a country, um, the ousters of individual um, uh, leaders becomes much more predictable. So um, if we look at uh, all 12 uh, leaders, patronal presidents in patronal presidential countries uh, since that time, um, and that's uh, up through 2016. Um, nine out of the 12 of them um, have been both unpopular and uh, lame ducks. And this includes, um, and here I'm including not just former Soviet kind of uh, recognized states, but also the unrecognized states. Um, and if you take only the recognized states, actually there's only one exception, uh, which I'll mention in a minute. So if we go to term limits, um, Basically, when the following leaders were overthrown, uh, Liban Tefetrasyan in Armenia in 96, Edward Shevardnadze in the Rose Revolution in 2003, um, Art Zimba, who's the leader of, uh, of Abkhazia, was actually overthrown in a similar kind of revolution in 2004, 2005, the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan, Akhaev in 2005, uh, Bakiyev, who was overthrown in Kyrgyzstan in 2010, uh, Edward Kakoyti, even in kind of the supposedly Russian dependency of South Ossetia, in 2012, and Mikhail Saakashvili in 2012-13, uh, when they were ousted from power, uh, they were all in this kind of situation. So um, if we take like the Georgian example, which is often seen uh, through the Rose Revolution as a kind of people power, um, we look at exactly kind of what happened during this process. Um, basically, Shevardnadze won re-election in 2000, um, but then announced, and he entered his constitutionally final term, um, but then he announced that he was not going to seek re-election. And so there was a, uh, even a, a report by the TASS news agency, which wrote uh, shortly after that, um, that announcement resounded like a gong among the, rough, er, among the Georgian elites. It is time to prepare. And it was shortly after that that Shevardnadze's justice minister, uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, resigned from Shevardnadze's government, um, as did a bunch of other people who had been associated with Shevardnadze's ruling party or government. Uh, they formed the core of the new opposition. So again, these are other people with their own networks um, breaking with the regime that had once been part of it um, after uh, succession uh, came strongly onto the table. Um, mobilized support. Um, Shevardnadze was very unpopular at the time, um, and uh, the opposition wound up winning. And so you can tell similar stories for each of these cases. Um, Leonid Kuchma in 2004 had the opportunity to run legally, uh, but chose not to do so, trying to usher into office uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Um, and uh, at this time, Kuchma's popularity was extremely low. Um, Yanukovych had some support in his regional base, but um, not much. Um, and so the result of that was the Orange Revolution. Um, and uh, Shevardnadze and uh, Igor Smirnov from uh, Transnistria, or the PMR, um, were over 70 when they were ousted. Um, so, if we look at the recognized post-Soviet states, Yanukovych in the Euromaidan revolution in 2014 is the only instance of a patronal president of the type that I've described here, um, representing a single pyramid system, um, to have been overthrown when he wasn't a lame duck. He, he was only in his first term of office. Um, he was extremely unpopular at the time. Um, and one can make a good argument that the reason he got overthrown was um, that he just made a series of incredibly bad political decisions um, inflaming the, the protests, which originally probably would have died out um, had he not started to aggressively apply uh, violence against the protesters and there, therefore turn um, you know, what had been protests against the European agreement that he probably could have negotiated with um, into uh, protests against him and uh, what was seen as his illegitimacy. Um, so all of this is not to say that you can't get um, any kind of competition when um, 
uh, you know, that, that basically, uh, uh, you know, wherever you get a lame duck syndrome, the authoritarian loses. Um, if the authoritarian team manages to win a, a good degree of popular support, it can survive these struggles. So um, Yeltsin was incredibly unpopular in 1999. That's one of the reasons that Moscow Mayor Lushkov, who I talked about earlier, was able actually to become um, you know, one of the favorites, either for him or his ally, Yevgeny Primakov, to become president uh, in the summer of 99. Um, but what changed this was Vladimir Putin being appointed prime minister, who was initially nothing in the ratings, and people kind of thought, well, when Yeltsin endorsed him, this was the kiss of death. Um, but then you have the apartment bombings in Chechnya of mysterious origin, um, and Putin as prime minister then ordering uh, Russian troops to move into Chechnya. And uh, you track his opinion poll results uh, in the presidential race throughout the fall of 99. And uh, in the matter of October, November, and December, already by December, he was up to over 50% support in the presidential race. And once he reached that 50%, um, it's at that point that you started to see Luzhkov's coalition fall apart. Um, I mean, his core people still supported him, uh, but other people started to defect towards Putin's side. And so already by March, uh, what had looked like a very close contest uh, at best for the Kremlin turned into a, a landslide victory that looked like it didn't really involve much competition at all. Um, you can see something uh, you know, kind of similar in Azerbaijan in 2003, um, where the elder Haydar Aliyev was, was dying, uh, managed to usher into power uh, his, uh, his son Ilham, uh, largely on the basis of his own authority as, as kind of the, the savior of Azerbaijan, um, having rescued it from state collapse. Um, and Armenia in 2008, you also had a presidential team, uh, president going into a lame duck period, but had a good degree of public support, so was able to hand off power to a successor. Um, but in all of these cases, again, whether or not the incumbent team won or the opposition, and even in opposition cases where we all thought they were Democrats, you know, Saakashvili had trained in, in the United States, right, was seen as, you know, uh, Oscar Akayev was seen when he was initially in power as Central Asia's lone democratic hope. Edward Shevardnadze, uh, before he was president of Georgia, um, was uh, the, the pro-democracy foreign minister and Politburo member of Gorbachev's Soviet Union who ended the Cold War, uh, warned Gorbachev against a hardline authoritarian coup. These were all people that were thought to be Democrats. They all wound up behaving kind of the same sort of authoritarian way once they were in power. So I think these kind of dynamics have a strong pull um, that can overcome a lot of personality uh, uh, types and a lot of personal um, convictions that might actually be pro-democracy. Um, so I won't go into a lot here because I want to wrap up and, 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 and have discussion, but um, uh, basically the question is how to escape the cycling. Um, what I mentioned before was um, factors that promote coordination of these elite networks around a single patron tend to reinforce a more authoritarian direction. So a presidentialist constitution by basically enshrining the symbolism of a single leader of the nation does that. So what about constitutions that don't do that? I've called these constitutions divided executive constitutions, where you have a president who's directly elected on one hand, but then on the other hand, you have a prime minister who is not directly elected by the population, but is beholden primarily to a, 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 an elected parliament who is not primarily dependent on the president. So it's not cases where the president appoints the prime minister, which makes the prime minister a secondary figure, but places basically where the result of a parliamentary election determines who the prime minister is. And if they have roughly equal executive powers, um, this tends to coordinate or to, to complicate the coordination of these networks because suddenly it's not obvious who the most powerful figure is going to be in the country. Um, at least if you have two different networks controlling these two different posts. Um, and so this starts to create space. So if you're a, a business person and you don't like what the president is offering you, um, you can break with the president and go over to the prime minister. The prime minister is likely to say, sure, come on to my side, I'll give you a good deal, because uh, they want you as an ally and they want to weaken the president. And people can do it the other way around. So this starts to create a lot of openness. And so again, this creates this situation of a competing uh, pyramid system um, where it's not clear who's going to dominate and people can go back and forth. Um, and it tends to be relatively open. Um, it can even be quite democratic, um, but again, it's a highly corrupt form of democracy. Uh, and so a lot of people wouldn't even call it democracy because it, they, they consider it so corrupt. So in Ukraine, after the Orange Revolution, this is essentially what you got. And so people thought, well, it's a lot more open now, but the government can't do anything because there's a constant uh, battles between whoever's prime minister and the president and, and other networks. 
Um, so if we look at the set of countries that have had these divided executive constitutions in the former Soviet Union, um, we find uh, since at least the early 90s that um, these are consistently the most democratic countries in the former Soviet space. So again, I mentioned Ukraine 2005 to 2010, um, highly corrupt, um, ineffective government, um, but democratic. This was, in fact was the only um, time uh, where a former Soviet country other than the Baltics was rated fully free by Freedom House. Um, here you stand since 2010, adopted this kind of constitution. That was after the uh, revolution that overthrew uh, President Bakia. Um, again, it was a state on the verge of state collapse and involving kind of ethnic pogroms. Um, but uh, you know, now you see uh, it, it, it's kind of sustained a much more open process. I mean, they've actually just instituted a new constitutional change um, which is shifting power to the prime minister. Um, so I need to kind of do more research to kind of figure out how uh, far that's gone. Um, but at least it, up until now, Kyrgyzstan has had that system. Um, one of the reasons I think Saakashvili fell was in 2010, um, he instituted a, a constitutional change that um, weakened the powers of the presidency and transferred them to the prime minister, effectively creating a divided executive constitution. Um, a lot of people think that he was trying to kind of create a prime ministership that he could then occupy to stay in power after his term limit was up. But whatever uh, his intentions, um, basically this turned him into a lame duck and undercut his authority at home. Uh, and so he lost power uh, before even being able to, uh, to do that. Uh, and Ukraine, after the Euromaidan revolution, adopted the, the same constitution that had been there uh, after the Orange Revolution. And again, it's been a much more openly competitive um, uh, uh, system since then. Uh, but again, not something that people would call a, an ideal democracy at all um, because of the role of corruption. Um, elsewhere in the world, you can point to cases like um, you know, Bulgaria and Macedonia. Okay, well, they're in the European Union, so there are a lot of other uh, reasons that they could be a little more democratic. And it's like if you compare, well, but if you compare Bulgaria, for example, for example, to Romania, um, which has a different political system, Bulgaria looks all right. Um, but I think one of the more interesting cases is Mongolia. Um, which uh, has had a pretty democratic system despite being in what one could argue is the worst democratic neighborhood possible, sandwiched between Russia and China. Um, so how do you explain that? Like, uh, you know, and I think that like, the, this kind of constitution um, has something to do with that. Um, and these have all been substantially more open than presidentialist countries, um, and including presidentialist periods in their own countries. So the periods when Ukraine had a presidentialist constitution, there was always this continued drift towards a more presidentialist power that's been much more difficult for any president to do um, with, with the divided executive constitution. So it's not to say these constitutions are like, uh, you know, unbreakable um, supports for one system or other. They can be overcome. Historical circumstance can change them. Um, the, in the right moment, a leader can change them. But they try to change them because they matter. And I think that's uh, why they, 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 you see this kind of pattern. Um, and the other thing you find that you don't find in the parliamentary or the kind of divided executive constitutions is that under presidentialist constitutions, um, you know, when you find these revolutions, um, they're almost always uh, followed by a new round of political closure, not the kind of ongoing openness that we see in these other uh, countries when they've tried them. Um, so uh, you know, again, thinking about the future, uh, I said it was predictable. Um, you know, it does. Like make us think that like countries that have this divided executive constitution, right? One prediction would be they're more likely to stay democratic in the future. So Georgia, uh, probably Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, first and foremost. Um, Moldova also re recently reinstituted a directly elected presidency, uh, but the presidency has very weak executive powers. Um, so it may actually be something more like a, uh, a divided executive constitution. Um, Places where revolution is most likely, well, those would be places that we would uh, uh, consider have leaders that may be becoming lame ducks for one reason or another and are unpopular. Um, right now, there are not a whole lot of those on the horizon. Um, Tajikistan, maybe, as Rahman ages. Um, and then we have to think about places where revolution may be possible, but something significant would have to change in terms of of public opinion. So places where you have leaders who are potentially becoming lame ducks, um, but have a lot of public support, possibly enough to kind of weather a succession crisis, um, like Kazakhstan, where uh, Nazarbayev is over 70, uh, but is highly, highly popular 
Um, and so, you know, he has a possibility of controlling a succession process. Um, and Armenia, arguably, is something similar. Um, so what does this mean with Russia? Possibility of a new Russian revolution? Uh, I definitely don't think one is going to happen in 2017. Uh, I don't think one will happen again in 2018 either, uh, which is when the next Russian presidential election is, is scheduled, um, because Putin is in the first of two consecutive terms that he's currently allowed. Um, but I do think after he wins the re-election in 2018, which I think he'll do based on this kind of logic, um, things start to get interesting, um, because suddenly this issue of succession starts to come up again. Um, he lengthened, or you know, he together with Dmitry Medvedev, his kind of uh, protege when he was president temporarily, um, lengthened the presidential terms to six years. So now Putin will have six years after 2018 to formally be able to stay in power. Um, but at some point, the elites around him, if the term limits are not removed, are going to increasingly think about how, um, you know, what they're going to do about the future. And uh, there's going to be some kind of jockeying uh, for power. And if Putin remains highly popular, my guess is he'll be able to control the whole process, just like he did in letting Medvedev be president temporarily while he was prime minister. But if he becomes a lot less popular, um, I think suddenly his ability to control the process uh, which looks so strong today, um, could actually evaporate fairly quickly and probably significantly in advance of uh, 2024, uh, which would be the next presidential elections. And so one potential flashpoint would be parliamentary elections, uh, which would be scheduled for uh, 2021. Um, so it's a bit ahead of the presidential election, but it could be seen as kind of a, uh, a test of strength for these different networks competing to influence the presidential election. Um, but again, you know, all these things are very hard to predict, but at least there does seem to be some regularity. Um, I can talk about it later, but I mean, it even does show up in some statistical analysis that I've done. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, so at least thinking about the future, this is where I would think kind of the, the danger points for uh, the stability in, in Russia would be. So I don't think they have anything to worry about now, but kind of moving forward, um, if they don't kind of maintain public support somehow, um, I think there's a danger. So um, let me wrap up there. I've talked a little more than I wanted to, but uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to talk about kind of anything related to this or uh, Russia generally or even other countries that you might like to talk about. So thank you very much.